welcome you here. I see my co-conspirators uh, uh, sitting around. I think that Margaret Chan is uh, the only one I can, I can see here now, but I'm told uh, Michelle CDB is on the way and uh, Tony Lake and uh, the World Bank will join us a little later. Um, and of course, uh, uh, newest addition from Zile uh, is sitting right there. The objectives of this meeting, of course, uh, is to highlight the multi stakeholder, collective and collaborative efforts and achievements of the H4 Plus at uh, global, regional, and country level, and the contribution to the Every Woman, Every Child uh, movement, which uh, the Secretary General started in 2010. And we also expect that during this meeting we'll address uh, the evolving opportunities and challenges uh, of the RM, RMNCH uh, landscape and uh, begin the conversation uh, of the positioning uh, of the H4 Plus uh, in the post-2015 uh, development space. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really the big picture of, of what this meeting is supposed to accomplish. And uh, to get us started, I would like to, uh, before uh, and I see uh, Michelle is sitting right here, welcome. Um, I, I want to say that uh, with H4 Plus, we've made remarkable progress. Uh, and we have also gained uh, a lot of momentum in the last uh, decade for improving health and well-being of women and children. And uh, that has enabled us to uh, realize in many circumstances and assist countries uh, towards the attainment of the MDGs uh, for 5A, 5A and B and 6. And uh, at the same time, I think it's critical for us to uh, give a caref careful attention to the root causes of social inequality, including the gender values of society and women's empowerment. Uh, now, so in a sense, what we're trying to accomplish is how the UN and its partners can do better on the ground and indeed uh, uh, ensure that uh, we can take this to a new level in the post-2015 space. So to kick us off, we will have two speakers. Um, and uh, the, the ministers uh, from Canada and the minister from, um, from Sweden, uh, Honorable Paradis, uh, who is the Minister of International Development and the Minister for the Francophony of Canada. Uh, Honorable Paradis uh, was appointed as Minister of International Development uh, of the Francophony in July 2013, and uh, before then was Minister of Agriculture, and uh, also held in the past uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and also the Ministry of Public Works, and uh, government services. So we have a truly well-bred Canadian uh, politician amongst us who would help us uh, dissect this matter. Uh, and uh, would also like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Angstrom, who is the Minister for International Development and Cooperation, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, who uh, has been at different times uh, spokesperson for the Modern Party of Sweden on gender equality issues <coughs> and uh, also be Minister of Employment and, uh, and uh, spokesperson again uh, on equality issues and the ombudsperson for the Swedish Police Union. Now, uh, I'm going to allow the ministers uh, to, to make their opening statements and give them a five-minute uh, um, uh, space to do this, and 
uh, it's not often that you have the opportunity to to put ministers on the spot. I shall put you on the spot because you have just five minutes. So, Christian. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, indeed, uh, it is an honor to join uh, the world's uh, leading experts in maternal, newborn, and child health to celebrate our uh, achievements and to discuss where our continued efforts are most uh, needed. Uh, improving maternal, newborn, and child health is Canada's top development priority, and this was made clear uh, what, uh, with uh, this was made clear by the Muskoka in, uh, Initiative in uh, 2010. Uh, and again, uh, when the Prime Minister Harper hosted the Saving Every Woman and Every Child Summit in Toronto this past May. Uh, we have come a long way since uh, the launch of the Muskoka Initiative and uh, the Global Strategy. And Canada and the world had uh, to face the heartbreaking truth that uh, MDG 4 and 5 were the furthest of track. But uh, thanks to Canada's leadership under our Prime Minister leadership and subsequent global action, we have seen progress. We marshaled the resources, partnerships, and innovation and record to make a real difference in the lives of women and children. And there continues to be energy, focus, and momentum to our work. And I truly believe we can end the preventable deaths of uh, mothers, newborns, and children. I truly believe our goals are within arm's reach. And we all know we are on the right track. We know that we need what we need to do and we need to put a greater focus on newborn survival increase our efforts on nutrition accelerate progress on maternal health strengthen civil registration and vital statistics and look to new and innovative financial financing tools and partnerships and I look forward to hearing more from the experts gathering here today on the opportunities to do this better from my perspective and in setting a course for how to deliver on our promise to women and children over the next five years, we should continue to prioritize those elements that have made the every woman, every child efforts so successful. So I'm talking about political leadership. And in Canada, we're blessed by the personal involvement and commitment by our strong leaders, such as Prime Minister Harper. And also I'm talking about financial commitment and uh, once again, the PM led by the example in the month of May by committing $3.5 billion for the tranche coming from 2015 to 2020. I'm talking about a common approaches, ambitious goals, and accountability. In terms of political leadership, Canada will deliver on the promise we have made to the world's women and children. But the magnitude, the, the magnitude of the challenge before us demands that all leaders prioritize the health of women and children. And I encourage the H4 partners to use platform, platforms like this week's UN General Assembly to advocate such a leadership. Ending preventable maternal and child deaths will not happen without increased financing. So once again, as I said, Canada stepped up to the plate with a new five-year commitment of $3.5 billion. And, but our success is dependent on similar increases from other countries as well as new and innovative streams of funding. The needs are vast, and governments alone do not have the resources nor the expertise to meet them. To meet them. That is why Canada is working with all partners committed to these goals, whether they are NGOs, CSOs, or the private sector. By prioritizing a common approach and by acting in unison, our effectiveness is multiplied. Canada will continue to build our programming on a solid foundation of accountability. We will ensure we remain focused on the needs of women and children, deliver real results, and prioritize the data needed to make decisions. And H4 partners have played a critical role in all of these areas. Canada will continue to count on your support, and we must assist countries to strengthen their CRVS systems. These systems are the legal basis for the realization of human rights and the foundation for rigorous accountability and merciful results. We can be proud of the work we've done and the lives we've saved, but we cannot be complacent and we must ensure that women's and children's health continues to be the top level priorities post 2015. We need increased attention for women's and children's health, ideally 
with a stand-alone goal. Since the launch of Muskoka Initiative, when our, prime, uh, when our Prime Minister took the leadership, we have proven what can be accomplished when we work in partnership. The H4 partnership has been the at the center of this effort and will remain so as we continue to work together to improve the lives of women and children around the world. So I thank you very much for this opportunity this morning. Thank you, Christian. And I want to say that uh, you have underscored the leadership of Canada. Canada actually uh, took the leadership at Muskoka and uh, led the whole world to focus on putting money uh, into uh, the uh, every woman, every child, and ensuring that uh, we we have resources for for what we have to do, and and to also say that uh, Canada challenged the world again uh, this year with the 3.5 billion uh, resources that uh, they've been pledged up until 2020. So, in a sense, Canada is always taking the leadership, and we truly appreciate that. And I want to say that. Uh, and something else which you have added uh, and place the emphasis too, apart from the women's and children's health, is that you brought uh, into the space the issue of civil registration, which I believe uh, data is an important thing and all of us actually uh, would like to support that and see that grow as we go forth. And, and we want to send a strong message through you to uh, the Prime Minister uh, for his leadership and uh, and I noticed that Mrs. Harper is here with us I would like to welcome her um, you know in our midst uh, you're welcome Your Excellency now now I will quickly move and uh, it was because of Canada's leadership that I loved more than five minutes so, I'll quickly move to uh, Minister Engstrom from, uh, from Sweden uh, to, give, uh, to give us our opening remarks. Thank you very much, um, uh, Your Excellencies uh, and friends and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. The Swedish government uh, has given high priority to the health of women and children during many years for, for two main reasons. The health and well-being of women and children is critical to development and poverty reduction and investment in health for women and children generate clear and tangible results. Development Cooperation for Health has delivered clear results. It has also been innovative in terms of using new technologies and working with the private sector. This has been possible only thanks to all of you, so thank you everyone. And this morning I would like to stress three points. I think we need a very strong push during 2015 to get as close as we possibly can to reach the MDGs. Our ambition must be to ensure that women and children are not only surviving, but also that they stay healthy. And the roles of the H4 uh, plus organizations are crucial, but we need an even more efficient and modern international global health system. We are making progress, but we need to accelerate. Recent figures show that both maternal and child mortality rates are declining. Ethiopia has already reached MDG4, and Bangladesh reached MDG5, which is fantastic. What is interesting in that progress is not only related to better trained staff and health services, but also to important uh, investments in education, in infrastructure, and in gender equality. But unfortunately, the situation is not as positive across the world. The situation is particularly there in conflict, post-conflict, and fragile states. So we need to do more. Canada has made an important, recently <laughs> indicating a total of 3.5 billion US dollars, which is fantastic for the five coming years. This is very much welcomed, of course, by all of us. We will not match Canada fully, <laughs> but our forecast indicates some $2.2 billion for the same five-year period. <laughs> and as part of this, I am pleased to announce
announced uh, that Sweden is specifically <coughs> making more than 400 million US dollar, dollars available for the coming five years for the further push to accelerate progress to, to reach uh, MDG 4 and 5A. And especially the focus will be given to sexual reproductive health and rights, not to mention rights. My, my government uh, have double financing in the field of uh, sexual reproductive health and rights since 2006, and I'm quite sure that the uh, incoming new government will, will continue in, in that way. Let me now turn to the future. With access to vaccines, drugs, and more trained staff, as well as more financial resources, we will see a continuous decline of communicable diseases. But let's not forget the non-communicable diseases. They are strongly li linked to changing family and social structures, lifestyles, and living conditions. Therefore, we need an agenda for the future post-2015, which will push to us to accelerate the unfinished work of the MDGs, make us take on work of preventing and managing, managing and non-communicable uh, diseases and ensure more equal access to <coughs> coverage of health services. And we must not lo lose focus on sexual reproductive health and rights. Survival is not going to be enough. We need as the overarching health goal to ensure that women and children are given the opportunity to live healthy, we, like Canada, have been working in close collaboration with the H4 Plus group in order to find the best possible ways of, ways of achieving impact on the ground. An effective, effective and coherent multilateral system is therefore vital for the system and for progress. This system is not efficient enough and it's not modern enough, not in terms of its proper function or in terms of how it is implemented and integrated in response to a country's need and demands. I call, and the Swedish government call for an honest, open and frank discussion on about how we, as international partners and governments, can take, take, can take our responsibility for global health challenges and what kind of international system we need for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister, and I, I want to also thank the government of Sweden for the commitment to $2.2 billion going forward. I think that uh, that's encouraging, but as you rightly said, I think putting the money to use is more important than, than the monitor. And what the money achieves on the ground, I think it's, uh, it's what we really must, uh, must show evidence for. So there has to be results, and there has to be results, and there has to be results. And I, I want to say that uh, apart from the Ethiopians and the Bangladeshis that you have, uh, you, have uh, you have identified as success stories, there are many countries that have done very well uh, that are not in fact in, in the scope right now. Some of them are close to attaining the MDGs, but even if they have not done so, the acceleration that has happened in those countries in the last few years has been phenomenal. I mean, we've seen changes occur in many parts of the world, uh, and, and I, in the course of today, uh, there are ministers and there are countries here that are going to speak to the changes that have, have occurred in that country. And I think that we need to encourage them to continue to do what they have to do. Um, I can tell you, for an example, that. Uh, uh, until Ebola struck Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was doing extremely well with maternal and newborn and child health. And I think that those are things we have to remind ourselves uh, of doing. Now, the other point I think which has not come out quite clearly, and I see my friend uh, uh, Michelle sitting there, is the issue of uh, mother to child transmission and the way that we've driven that down considerably around the world. Now, focusing just on two or three countries that we have to try and do that and accomplish it. The last point that we, we have to make is the, is the point of integration. I think we've integrated better now than we've ever done before. And going forward uh, into post-2015 and the issue of the QCPR and how we're supposed to function as delivering as one, I think it is even going to get better. So. Uh, resources are going to have more value 
And we as H4 Plus actually want to promise you that we can give you better value for money uh, for your investment. Uh, thank you very much. Now let me, at this juncture, just thank the two ministers and I would uh, wish you applaud them and ask them to do this. I believe that uh, the two ministers have set the stage for a very, uh, uh, a, a very uh, lively conversation. So I'm going to move now to my colleagues uh, and, and ask uh, the H4 Plus uh, um, uh, leaders to join me uh, on on the on the high table. So I would ask uh, uh, Margaret Chan. Uh, Tony Lee, um, and Michelle Sidibe from Zile, <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that whilst uh, whilst we are in the conversation, uh, Tim Evans is going to join us. Now the process of this is even better because. Uh, again, it's not often that I have the opportunity to ask questions of Margaret Chan. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to have to do this. And as you can see, just to uh, compliment the Secretary General, um, gender equality almost uh, is here. And uh, um, we've had uh, more appointments in the senior cadre of the United Nations under the Secretary General uh, than ever before, women taking place, taking uh, positions, uh, you know. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's a great credit to Ms. Ban Ki Moon as Secretary General. Now, Tony, since uh, 2010, the H4 Plus is the technical arm of, um, of the every woman, every child. Could you share the key achievements made by the H4 Plus and what should be done to better inform RMNC policies and programs at country level, <coughs> including potential changes in global aid architecture? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Baba Chande. Uh, I am very, very happy to be here. Uh, I should uh, say at the beginning uh, that I'm probably the only person can you hear me? You can hear me? I'm probably the only person on the panel uh, who remains a student of these issues, uh, and I've been learning from my colleagues who know uh, more about it than I do. Uh, but uh, I am certainly passionate about it uh, and do have some strong views on where we are and where we're going and where we have been. Uh, let me just start, of course, with the good news. Uh, and that is, and I think we all know these numbers, uh, that uh, under five mortality uh, has declined by almost half since 1990. Uh, and that means from 12.7 uh, million children who died uh, unnecessarily uh, of causes we know how to uh, address uh, to cut down to uh, 6.3 million uh, in 2013. We know that number. What I find really interesting is that the rate of decline since the early 1990s has hugely accelerated and has tripled uh, since that uh, period. So we're making not just progress, but faster and faster uh, progress. That's the great news. But uh, the bad news, of course, is that 17,000 children will die today uh, and every day still. Uh, and also, and what I want to focus on, uh, is that while we've done very well in bringing down under five uh, mortality as a whole, uh, that uh, we have not uh, achieved a similar rate of success among newborns. Uh, and so uh, that is something that we really have to focus on in the H4 Plus and certainly all of us uh, beyond. And one reason, and I want to focus on that, uh, is that it, this requires a higher standard of care 
than uh, for under five mortality generally, where mass vaccination programs, et cetera, have uh, made such an impact. So how do we do this? How do we address uh, this front in our struggle? Uh, and I think we can think about it in the H4 plus uh, in three ways. Uh, one is that we have to continue with uh, what we've been doing quite well, and that is increasing the quantity of health workers at the community level and in the most disadvantaged areas. And we have to keep pushing on that, skilled health workers. But we have to focus now all the more on the quality of the care that they are able to provide and that we can provide uh, to pregnant mothers, uh, women in labor, uh, and newborn children. Uh, because 2.8 million babies last year died in the first month of their life. So first, keep pushing out skilled health workers as we've been, the quantity issue. Uh, and on quality, then we have to focus on the supplies that they need uh, and on also, and we don't think about this enough, I think, create the demand for it so that uh, people will be motivated to come in and get a higher quality care that we can uh, provide. The H4 Plus is focusing on both the quantity issue and the quality issue. Uh, and I might add, there, there is kind of a parallel here to education, where MDG's, uh, MDG2 has been uh, wonderful in increasing the number of children in school and lousy, frankly, uh, in uh, making sure that they get an education in the school. And there's a somewhat similar uh, issue here. So the H4 Plus uh, on the <coughs> question of, especially of supplies, and I see Tori here, uh, uh, has been very involved with the Commodities Commission uh, and in the RMNCH uh, fund in, for example, getting more oxytocin to prevent postpartum uh, hemorrhage, uh, in getting uh, chlorhexidine to prevent infections in newborns, et cetera, et cetera, uh, out there. Um, on the ground, uh, the H4 Plus has been, and on the ground I emphasize, uh, has been training uh, healthcare providers, or thousands of healthcare providers in 10 countries, uh, and training midwives in countries like Cameroon, and upgrading health facilities, uh, as for example in Liberia, uh, where a mother can access specialized care for premature uh, babies and couldn't before and uh, in promoting the demand that we need to see, uh, for example, the uh, mama kits in Zambia, where mothers coming into a health facility get a kit with various baby supplies, et cetera, uh, which has increased uh, uh, their uh, usage by 44%. So my point is that while we have to worry about global architecture, uh, that what matters above all, as I heard you saying, Baba Tunde, is results on the ground. And if I could note that all of you uh, uh, who are particularly concerned about UN agencies delivering as one, uh, as reflected in the QCPR passed by the General Assembly, uh, what matters is delivering one as one on the ground. And I was very happy that the standard operating procedures then of the, came out of the QCPR focused on results groups uh, rather than endless process uh, planning in a whole country team, uh, but looking at those agencies that work together to achieve results in specific areas. And the H4 Plus in health has been working very well together in country after country to achieve the results that we absolutely have to uh, achieve. So again, uh, I think we need to keep shifting our focus then um, towards uh, quality uh, as well as quantity, uh, doing it on a number of fronts, whether it's supplying the commodities, training skilled health workers, incentivizing people to come in to receive this care, uh, and I think the H4 Plus is going to be at the heart of that struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And I want to underscore, uh, Tony says he's a student of this, and uh, he taught us equity. Uh, Tony brought equity into this system. And I think he, he was ahead of all of us in terms of ensuring that we talk about equity 
been delivered. And I think it's, uh, it's now, all of us have in integrated into our DNA in terms of what we do. Uh, and I want to also underscore the issue of the various things that have happened with the H4 Plus, which might not be apparent to many people. The uh, production of high level quality staff at the, uh, at the country level, upgrading of facilities to be able to look at Somalia. Uh, we actually were responsible for training of all the midwives in Somalia today. And I think we need to continue to talk about this. Uh, yes, there is still much to do, but I, I believe that H4 Plus, in the way that we're working together, uh, we, can, we can make a difference uh, going forward. I, I'll just uh, quickly mention something else which Tony talked about, which is the Commission on Commodities. The hardest part of Northern Nigeria, of Nigeria today, is Northern Nigeria. And I know that we are working as a plus to deliver chloexidine and misoprostol to pregnant women, and we have done so to more than 100,000 women. And I think it's important for us to, to advertise these sort of things because these are, these are the results that we have. It might not uh, make national news, <coughs> but it saves the lives of women and children, and I think that's an important thing. Uh, I will quickly move on to uh, my big sister. <laughs> he means I'm <coughs> old. <laughs> uh, and, and to say that, uh, despite, and you can see, despite what she's doing incredibly for Ebola, she's still looking good, huh? Um, <laughs> now, Margaret, <laughs> the commitment on accountability in the every one of every child are focused on four main components, measurement, data management, inclusion and participation, transparency, and independence, and governance. Uh, could you give us an update on the progress on accountability, and how the H4 Plus commitment of, to accountability can help uh, improve maternal uh, and childhood? Thank uh, you, thank you uh, my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> Is it working? <coughs> Hello? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning to all of you. And uh, in particular, I want to welcome my uh, second home, Canada. Mrs. Harper and Mr. Perry, thank you for being here. And thank you for the generosity. I like to make Sweden my third home. <laughs> it's slightly cold for me, but uh, I'll try. You know, if I can stand Canada in my younger days, I'm sure I'll do quite well in Sweden as well. Well, jokes aside, really, this is really just to add some energy to the meeting. Talking about uh, accountability, I think one great result of this H4 Plus partnership, of course, is to really support government and also bring partners together, development partners, civil society, and the industry to make sure that we deliver on results, as Tony and also Baba Tundi mentioned about. So we should be very happy that the H4 Plus family has, over the years, continued to make improvements. We were not there in the past, let's be honest. And over time, you know, with your encouragement, with your support, and with your push, we are getting better and better. Now, talking about accountability, a lot of people make commitments, committing to resources and committing to results. It is about time to talk about accountability. And I have to say, uh, you know, flowing from the G8 meeting at that time, the Muskoka Initiative, some countries truly pledged with new money, others, reprogram their money, and that's not the way to go. When you pledge, we expect you to bring in new money. And of course, with those money, whoever received the money should deliver on the results where they are supposed to be instead of uh, sending your money to Switzerland. Now, 
Because I'll be a just. <coughs> well, use your imagination. Okay. Now, I have to say, you know, the Commission on uh, Information and Accountability, co chaired by uh, President Kikwete and Prime Minister Harper, set the tone on the importance of transparency and accountability. So, a few years down the road, accountability is in our DNA, in all the programs that we do. Otherwise, we cannot be answerable to the people of the world that we collectively are serving. Now, talking about human rights, uh, and, and I used to say that when you are you know, a, a, an individual, when you were born, you were not even given an identity. What kind of right are you talking about? So the importance of civil registration is extremely, extremely important to get, to enable a child to have the right to access education, health services, and when they grow up, you know, when they get a job, also pay tax as part of the responsibility to the government. So I, we are very passionate about civil registration. And then, of course, when we talk about accountability, we do need to have figures to count, to measure. If I tell you, half of the world's births today, they are not reported and all registered. Two thirds of all the deaths in the world are not registered. So how do you, development partners, count or measure results? Let's be serious about this, okay? We base a lot on estimates, surveys. They continue to be important, but we need to improve the system that can give you, you know, accurate information for us to measure. So that is a very important piece for me in terms of measurement and data management, and especially disaggregating the data to show whether or not there are inequities in certain groups or in certain areas that are hidden uh, by uh, average. Now then, in order to hold people to account for results and resources, we must be inclusive in terms of participation, allowing civil societies especially <coughs> to hold governments to account and to hold the UN agencies to account. The third point is transparency and independence. Yes, we always talk about the importance of um, accountability. Whether or not you have a mechanism at the country level, which is most important, uh, to really do independent evaluation of results. I mean, it is, well, I see a lot of governments here. Uh, let's be honest, nowadays I don't know what's the problem. Governments are not always trusted by their people. Something is wrong. UN is also not trusted by the people. Something is wrong. We really need to drill down and look at what are the reasons. Well, maybe that is the way of media here today. No. No media. <laughs> you never know. Never know. That's not good. Media is important. Yeah, social media, media is good. Media, hold us to account. That is extremely important. <laughs> so that's why I'm media. saying the being inclusive, uh, uh, community engagement and participation, have total transparency. That is extremely important to build trust. And I want to thank the um, uh, Minister of Health from DRC. Uh, he's here. Uh, Minister Felix, you did wonderful thing in managing the Ebola outbreak in DRC. And because you were so transparent <laughs> on day one and, and working in such a, a robust manner, you managed to contain, as in the past, uh, of the Ebola outbreak uh, in your country. That let me also reinforce the importance of governance. President from your country was involved on day one. And we, because the vast land of the country, in order to go from the capital to the village where the outbreak was happening, if you travel by car or by, the, by boat, it will take you days. And the president literally mobilized, mobilized air uh, transport of course, with the support of World Food Program and UN UNHAS, and to make, you know, uh, to the village. And that, there's another lesson to learn from the minister 
On day one, they engage the community, explain the disease, and bring them on board to manage uh, case con uh, cases and also contact tracing. Instead of what we are seeing in other countries, the community is actually fighting the government. When you have such a situation, there's no way people can break under control such a nasty disease. So let me finish by what we mean by accountability. You need information. You need to be transparent. You need to be inclusive to engage all partners so that they, we can build the trust. And last but not the least is about leadership and governance of government to make that happen. So on that, let me thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margaret. And, and I want to underscore two things. Uh, the first, of course, is that political leadership is very important. Political leadership is what ha makes things happen on the ground in any country. We learned that, I'm not taking the, uh, the winner of the sale of uh, Michelle, but we learned that with the H HIV uh, 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 pandemic. Once the leadership of the country takes charge, it doesn't happen. So that is one. The second, of course, is that we must be accountable to the people we serve, all the way to the ground. And and uh, I want to say, uh, and to thank uh, Prime Ministers Harper and, Kikwe and President Kikwete for leading the world in the framework that, uh, uh, the academic framework, which in fact is part of the everyone as a child, <laughs> which has held all of us accountable to the work we do, and to which we report on an annual basis, which, again, if you look back on the MDGs when it started, it was not that. And I think that that's something which we, we need to remind ourselves, and that's a product of what the H4 Plus uh, has been doing together. Now, finally, I think the issue of civil registration going forward uh, is an important thing. The ICTD <coughs> review, tells us that there are at least 109 countries in the world that have no civil registration systems at all. So we need to build that with them as we go forward so that data can be more robust. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Margaret. And let me now call on Michelle Sidibe uh, and to say that civil society and community engagement is crucial for addressing equity and ensuring universal access to health services uh, for women and children. How should we approach, how should approaches to healthcare and the health architecture facilitate the engagement of civil society and communities effectively in uh, RMNCH and how should H4 Plus successfully engage community responses? Now, now this is the first time I'm going to impose five minutes on you. I know that uh, you are more efficient. I will use uh, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Babatunde. I want just uh, to say that uh, if you reflect on uh, what we have been uh, just uh, saying right now, you will see that uh, we have been uh, making a lot of progress. But uh, if you look at our uh, last GAP report, what is coming out of this report is that even though we are making progress, we have been not able to reach many people. We have been, people are left behind. And those people who have been left behind are unfortunately the people who are suffering much. It's people without voice, it's people who need really our services. And if you take, uh, just to give you a few data, you will see, for example, uh, that uh, no one is talking about uh, prisoners. Prisoners uh, uh, in most of the places today, 50%, I said that 50% more risk to have uh, 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 HIV or FC. You talk about sex workers, 13% uh, of them having 13% uh, uh, more risk to be infected with uh, HIV. We are talking about a man having sex with man. We are talking about uh, uh, young women. If you go, for example, in a continent like mines, 43% I said 43% the report revealed that uh, the, uh, uh, of those young women had uh, their first uh, sexual intercourse uh, uh, against their will. 
So if we don't uh, change completely the way we are uh, delivering services, the way we are interfacing with those people, the way we are making sure that uh, we break the conspiracy or silence on those issues, we'll not be able uh, uh, to talk about universal access. We'll not be able to talk about universal health. And that means uh, that we need necessarily to think about a different uh, subsystem, a subsystem of health subsystem of health which is built not necessarily only on our traditional approach but built on community you go to countries like uh, uh, ethiopia I, I don't know if the minister of ethiopia is here yes, but yeah. <coughs> he can uh, tell us that they have been able to use hiv aids money to train 35,000 uh, community health worker those community health workers are making the interface with the uh, community, creating demand for services. So fostering what you call uh, uh, accountability, but I will say fostering public accountability. Because that is even more important, because we can have a good report. But if we don't foster public accountability to make sure that we will have a demand, it will not work. Ebola is uh, showing clearly this crisis. It's not so much the crisis of uh, lack of commitment of our government. I'm seeing the Minister of Health of uh, uh, Ivory Coast. I talked to her, we were uh, discussing. They contain also the cases there. But the biggest problem is the interface between service provider and community. How to really reinforce that, how to make sure. So I, I personally feel that it's time for us in our global health architecture to also think about how we will move from this traditional paradigm to think about more stronger community-based approach, uh, trying to transfer knowledge competencies, because you talk about that through our education system, and making sure that we deal with the equity. And that will never happen without uh, uh, reinforcing the capacity of uh, civil society. And when I'm talking about civil society, I'm not just talking about uh, uh, NGOs which are contracting. Because that is fine, I don't say that. But if you look at even with Médecins Sans Frontières today, excellent uh, organization, NGOs, but we are seeing their limits. What we need is a, a true transfer of competencies at community level by uh, creating a real army of people who will be able to reach uh, uh, people who are down there without us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michel. I think that you have hit a, a very important uh, note on, on the work that uh, 84 Plus does. And uh, community engagement is what is going to make the difference. And uh, I'm not going to uh, anti I'm not going to take the substance away from what Minister Cassetta is going to talk about. But, but I think that in every country now, and Ethiopia uh, is a good example, but Ethiopia actually has, is now beginning to serve as the hub for trading of health workers around the, the African continent. So, so it's, it's, this, this, this matter is, is, is being taken very seriously, <laughs> and, and I believe that that's something we need to expand upon. But, but I think the paradigm that you're talking about more than anything else is that health, no, I think we can still go on. Uh, health has to be owned by the community. We, we have to have communities own their health because that is the only way that it should become effective. So thank you very much. Now let me quickly move on to Fumzile and to ask Fumzile to speak to um, uh, the issues of partnership. Now, partnership and effective coordination is key to scale, uh, to scale up uh, uh, for impact in the in the area that we work, the Ironman C8. Can you share with us the highlights of the H4 coordination approach and the benefits of the H4 collaboration with Ironman C8 stakeholders at all levels? From Zilli. Thank you. Uh Back to moderator, and thank you very much <laughs> to all fellow panelists. If Tony is a learner, my, my learning cap is even steeper, I can assure you. Uh, 
As uh, UN Women, one of our mandates is coordination and partnership. Because uh, gender mainstreaming at its best is partnership and is coordination for impact. And uh, if we're talking about women and children, that is an area in which we have uh, our responsibility as UN Women. Gender equality and women's empowerment are fundamental for achieving our shared goals because women take responsibility for health, they are caregivers, they look after children, they are the ones that uh, also pay attention to education, and they're the ones who, who are conveying and taking action on health messages that should be received in a community. And I think in the Ebola crisis, we've seen the importance of women as caregivers, as well as the, the challenge that we've faced as we have lost so many women health workers because of being in the front line. When we coordinate a, and teach women and empower them to play a role, that makes all our work more powerful and more productive. <coughs> our focus on women's empowerment and leadership consolidates individual interventions into a broader movement and helps us to ensure, to ensure sustainability. If you take the example, for instance, of alien child marriages, through coordination we can achieve more powerful rights because that is everybody's responsibility. It is a UNICEF responsibility, UNFPA, WHO, UNESCO, and so on, around this one child that we want to see. And we can only achieve that if we coordinate. In, in relation to uh, 4H, Plus, I just want to highlight some examples uh, of uh, our successful coordination. Uh, in Sierra Leone, with the support of H41, civil society lobbied the government to double financial support to reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, including contraception, between 2011 and 2014. And they were very successful, both in terms of increasing the resources available and the impacts thereof. The long-standing process, the presence of H4 Plus partners in countries like DRC, Guinea-Bissau, and others have enabled 4H1 to engage with private and civil society networks on policy reform, technical needs, advocacy, and communication and implementation. And again, the, that has had positive impact on both delivery and scale. We have long lessons from MDGs and the 4H1 experience, which are, will be critical for us in the post-2015 <laughs> agenda. The benefits uh, of those lessons uh, include the importance of collaboration as South-South, further partnerships with private sector, which we have seen uh, in also in, in, four, uh, in H1+. Plus. We've seen the develop the the development of new coordination mechanism for global reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health financing. All of this can ensure that uh, we improve uh, our results. We can also be encouraged by the strong outcome document of the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals, but we must ensure that the commitments around reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health are upheld in the, fin in the final outcome and honored in implementation. And that with our coordination will mean that uh, we make a big difference. I would, however, also be the first one to highlight the fact that coordination for coordination's sake may end up uh, leading us to have long meetings and not really taking us to the heart of implementation. So coordination is also about planning and choosing the areas where coordination makes a difference. The research that we did as UN Women on coordination uh, through our evaluation unit showed that there were areas where coordination was absolutely important and gave us best results, but there were areas where coordination slowed us down. So we need to plan better if we want coordination. And coordination at a country level for the purpose of our work that we're discussing is absolutely important. Coordination at headquarters without coordination at country level does not give us the benefits that we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosile. I also think that uh, we, we have to underscore the fact that uh, country plans and coordinated country plans and uh, 
Margaret has uh, led all of us to think about the IHP plot and how we can use that mechanism to help countries to produce costed plans to be able to give us what we need to work together on the ground. And I think that is a successful uh, place going forward. Now, we have a challenge, and the challenge, of course, is that the General Assembly is going to open very soon, but we have to hear from the countries because that's where, you know, the we have to chase the pudding because that's where it is really happening. There are two, three ministers here, and I know they are very, uh, they they are they are very succinct in the in their delivery. Um, the minister of health from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, the minister of health from uh, DRC, and the minister of health from Ethiopia. So I would thank my colleagues uh, from the Asia Plus. So I don't dismiss people, I just thank you. And I will ask the three ministers to come uh, so that uh, they can be part of this conversation. while they're settling down, let me just underscore the things that we have been talking about. You know, the um, RMNCH uh, issues and the architecture that has enabled us to deliver for women and children, the issue that the A4 Plus has provided a technical leadership role, convening role, advocacy role, engagement and collaboration, and we've been able to focus on root cause of maternal and child mortality and mobility on the ground. So I, I, I think these are key things that uh, we must, uh, we must uh, speak to. So we'll move quickly and ask uh, Minister Felix Mumbe from the uh, from DRC, the Minister of Health from DRC, to speak. Je veux vous prier de prendre vos micros parce que vous êtes en français. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Babatunde. Euh, J'aimerais dire que dans le cadre d'accélérer les efforts en vue d'atteindre les objectifs du millénaire 4 et 5, le gouvernement de la RDC a depuis euh, 2013 euh, préparé, avec l'appui en particulier de H4+, euh, une, une feuille de route intitulée le cadre d'accélération des OMD 4 et 5. Et j'aimerais très rapidement insister sur les grandes réalisations que nous avons eues avec euh, H4+, d'abord sur le plan politique, Ce sont les politiques et stratégies fondées sur l'évidence qui ont été élaborées par le gouvernement, notamment les projets de loi sur la santé et la reproduction, le plan stratégique national de la planification familiale, mais également le plan stratégique national du VIH avec un emphase sur la PTME. Sur le plan de la plaidoirie, ou du plaidoirie la campagne d'accélération de la réduction de la mortalité maternelle en Afrique, le karma, a été lancé en RDC le 4 avril 2011 sous le haut patronage à l'implication de la première dame, Madame Olive Lembe euh, Kabila. Et nous avons pu faire une feuille de route qui a permis à mobiliser des ressources nationales pour la santé de la mère et de l'enfant. J'aimerais aussi insister sur le rôle catalytique des fonds euh, de H4O, ceux qui ont aidé à mobiliser l'appui et même l'engagement des partenaires pour la santé de la mère et de l'enfant. Par exemple, il y a une note d'engagement des partenaires qui a été adoptée en mai 2014 et qui a obtenu des engagements de plusieurs partenaires pour s'aligner autour du cadre d'accélération des OMD 4 et 5. J'aimerais aussi parler de la plateforme de coordination technique parce qu'en fait, avec le H4+, il y a eu un appui technique et financier pour la redynamisation de la euh, Task Force Santé de la Mère, du Nouveau-Né et de l'Enfant, qui est une plateforme de coordination, de partage d'expérience et d'informations entre les partenaires. Et notons également le rôle important dans le renforcement 
du système de santé parce que le H4 Plus appuie le gouvernement dans ses efforts à renforcer le système de santé, y compris le renforcement des ressources humaines pour la santé, la construction et la réhabilitation des établissements sanitaires. Ici, je vais souligner deux choses. D'abord, un, nous avons avec euh, H4 Plus euh, et le gouvernement mis en place une nouvelle filière de formation des sages-femmes. Et cela a appuyé six institutions de formation des sages-femmes au niveau supérieur. Deuxièmement, nous avons créé dans un hôpital général de référence dans la province du Bandundu une maternité d'attente. Parce que les femmes sont loin des structures médicales, cette maternité d'attente permet de recevoir jusqu'à 15 femmes qui viennent de très loin pour venir attendre le temps de euh, l'accouchement. Et cela a permis d'améliorer la santé de la, de la femme. Euh, je voudrais dire un mot sur le paquet d'intervention fondé sur euh, euh, l'évidence. En fait, avec le H4+, euh, nous avons mis ensemble un paquet d'intervention à haut impact qui est fondé notamment sur la gestion rationnelle des 13 médicaments essentiels, y compris les kits familiaux, le financement basé sur les résultats, les soins obstétricaux et néonataux d'urgence, la planification familiale, le partenariat, le renforcement des capacités des ressources humaines, la communication pour le développement ainsi que l'engagement communautaire. J'aimerais peut-être juste dire une chose, nous avons eu une mission de H4+, en février de l'année en cours, et grâce à cette euh, mission qui était composée de l'UNICEF, l'OMS, l'UNFPA et le, le MUSIDA, ONU Femmes et la Banque mondiale, il y a eu un certain nombre de recommandations et un atelier de consensus a été organisé. Cela nous a permis de valider ou d'adopter une note d'alignement des partenaires et un plan conjoint 2014-2015 et de, de mise en œuvre du plan d'accélération. L'adoption de ces deux documents a permis à tous les partenaires de pouvoir s'aligner et nous travaillons en synergie de manière efficace et efficiente en suivant justement ce cadre euh, d'accélération. Je voudrais dire en conclusion que je tiens à souligner que les efforts euh, du H4+, dans la mobilisation des partenaires à s'aligner au cadre d'accélération des OMD 4 et 5 a été très déterminant au niveau de la RDC. Je tiens à remercier Marguerite Chan et tous ceux qui sont intervenus tout à l'heure pour Ebola. Et nous disons, le président Kabila a dit, et nous l'avons déclaré hier à Marguerite Chan et à David Nabarro, que la réponse ou la riposte à l'épidémie d'Ebola en Afrique doit bénéficier d'un leadership africain très important. Nous remercions la communauté internationale pour l'appui technique et logistique, mais dès les prochaines semaines, la RDC va mettre des brigades sanitaires d'intervention on va former et même les pays africains qui le désirent peuvent, pourront envoyer des gens à Kinshasa pour être formés afin que nous intervenions ensemble, nous-mêmes les Africains, à, en Afrique de l'Ouest, mais que nous préparions des agents formés pour la riposte dans nos pays respectifs. Je vous remercie. Honorable Minister, merci beaucoup et je veux acknowledger le bon travail que vous faites dans le DRC. Um, and uh, with this of course, uh, and we, we uh, do appreciate that for a country in transition, you have been able to take things to a, a different level, building human resources for health, reaching out to communities, advocacy, and you know, the acceleration framework which we have developed with you has also enabled you to put resources to work better. And I want to also underscore what Margaret said, your very robust but proactive response to Ebola, I think it's also a testimony to the fact that your system is working. Because uh, I always say Ebola, uh, and like uh, Lassa fever or any other, uh, is, is, uh, talks to the fragility of systems. Once systems are in place, we can always contain those things. But if systems are not in place, then you have the progress which you have with South Africa today. So let me thank you very much. Now let me move quickly to uh, the Minister of Health from uh, Ethiopia, Honorable uh, Kaseda, who will speak to us uh, very quickly about uh, what has happened in Ethiopia. Um, I think many of us are aware, but uh, it's better to listen uh, to this from the thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, uh, doing very well in, in, in terms of uh, reducing maternal and child mortality and in controlling communicable diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria. We are on track to achieve all the NTT goals, and this was possible uh, because of uh, three or four factors. And the most important factor is country ownership. Whenever I got the opportunity, I always talk about this. And this is uh, also true in the, co in the context of the H4 plus arrangement as well. In Ethiopia, we make sure that we determine the agenda, we determine the priorities, and we determine where the investment has to go. And with a strong country ownership and country leadership, and with government being on the driving seat, and when we talk about governments being on the driving seat, we have to also take care that there are no bus drivers who tell you where to go. <laughs> so in Ethiopia, we always make sure that we are on the lead and our development partners and all other players are supporting the national plan. And this has helped the country to achieve the results, and it has also helped us to build a strong health system. When we started the health extension program, our flagship program, some development partners were saying that this is you know, a crazy program. You are asking community health workers to take care of a number of responsibilities with only one year of training. Even our senior health professionals were questioning the philosophy of the health extension program. But 10 years down the line, we are reaping the benefit of this important innovative program, but at the same time, we are also bringing the community at the forefront of health promotion, <coughs> disease prevention, and as Michel was saying earlier, taking the responsibility. All of us take responsibility for our own health. There is no reason why a rural farmer a rural family will not be able to take their responsibility about health if they get adequate information, if they get a skill, they will be able to take responsibility. They will be able to demand services. And that was the spirit uh, that we uh, embarked on. So with a strong country ownership, with a strong national plan, and with government on the lead, it is possible to achieve results. Certain implementation at scale. This is also very important. For a country of you know Ethiopian size, we are not satisfied with implementation in one or two or three districts. Beautiful, you know, projects, pilot projects. That may not be scaled up. Our motto is let's go to national scale with proven intervention. We used H4 plus resources to train annually 2,000 midwives. When we started this, some partners questioned the quality of the training because we had you know, lower rate of institutional delivery. After we embarked on that training, institutional delivery has gone up. All our health facilities started to be busy, and our midwives the trainees have the practicum side for them to be skilled enough uh, in, 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 in midwifery skills. So going to national scale with, with ambition of reaching every segment of the, com the community is also important. And the third important thing is accountability. I'd like to underscore what Margaret Chan said earlier. And in Ethiopia, we take it one step further, and we developed what we call the scorecards. So every quarter, we send out scorecards to, to re regional presidents, to district governors, and to all politicians who are responsible for overseeing the health sector. And we held ourselves accountable. Whenever I send out the quarterly report, the national quarterly report to my prime minister, he always calls me and say, Kasata, why are we having so many raids in such and such region? 
What are you supporting them so that they improve their performance? So we really need to have the guts to, to be held accountable. And for the community to hold, to hold us accountable as well. We have now developed scorecards for health facilities that are presented during town hall meetings every quarter to the community representatives. And this is a kind of accountability we need to foster and grow in Africa so that we have, uh, we deliver results for the community. So these are my interventions. Thank you very much. I think it's profound what you have said, uh, Minister Kaseze. Community engagement, community intervention, and making sure that you continue to develop the skills that are required to deliver, and then the issue of accountability, which uh, we must uh, we must uh, entrench and ensure that everybody practices, because at the end of the day, it is to the people that we are accountable, and and if you can improve the services, then we can go on. And I'm glad that you did say that H4 Plus uh, is responsible for uh, an annual training of 2,000 midwives to ensure that institutional deliveries have gone up. And I dare say that also family planning practices have gone up. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that's, that's something which we must celebrate. But also use uh, Ethiopia as a contact for other countries that want to learn this and we as H4 have also been using you uh, to facilitate other countries to come and, and learn about what you're doing. Now, I'm, I left the best to the last, uh, the, the lady of the house. Um, Raymond Kofi is the Minister of Health uh, and the fight against AIDS, AIDS in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, she will speak about what's happening je vous remercie. Excusez-moi. Euh, mesdames et messieurs, je vous remercie. Euh, merci. Je vous remercie de donner la parole et je voudrais vous dire que, en ce qui concerne euh, la Côte d'Ivoire, euh, en 2013, euh, le président de la République a dédié cette année euh, à la santé. Euh, justement pour mettre un accent particulier sur euh, le fort taux de mortalité euh, maternelle et infantile que nous avons euh, eu après donc euh, la crise que tout le monde, excusez-moi, que tout le monde connaissait et qui s'est tenue euh, pendant une près de une dizaine d'années. Et comme vous savez que la population, les populations les plus vulnérables sont les femmes et ce sont toujours les femmes et les enfants au moment des crises qui subissent donc ce type d'exaction. Donc il fallait une volonté extrêmement, euh, j'allais dire forte pour que justement euh, la question de la mortalité maternelle infantile soit une euh, et la priorité dans le programme euh, de gouvernement de son excellence, monsieur le président de la République. Donc au cours de cette même année, nous avons également à un très haut niveau euh, réalisé donc, la karma. Donc tout ça dans cette mouvance, nous avons également, euh, la, le gouvernement a donc soutenu l'initiative euh, H4+. En ce qui concerne, donc, euh, je pense que nous allons aller assez vite, donc en ce qui concerne les actions euh, que euh, la Côte d'Ivoire a menées dans ce cadre, c'est que nous avons euh, focalisé euh, nos activités sur euh, des zones où, euh, justement, le taux de mortalité maternelle infantile était extrêmement élevé. Donc, cela consistait un peu avec euh, 8 districts issus donc, de trois régions sanitaires. Alors, je vais vous dire que les, les bénéficiaires ont concerné euh, pratiquement 370 000 587 femmes en âge de procréer. Cette action H4+, a également concerné 51 022 nouveau nés En Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons beaucoup les chiffres maintenant, puisque nous avons un président qui est un économiste. Donc, euh, tout ce que nous faisons aujourd'hui, et je crois que H4+, nous a aidé dans ce sens, puisque le fait de pouvoir faire la collecte de données nous a permis. Vous ne pouvez pas vous mettre en face du président de la République et venir lui dire « oui, on a fait ça ». Il vous dit ça, « ça fait combien ?» Alors donc nous avons également euh, pu mettre, euh, faire bénéficier HK+, à 221 431 enfants de moins de 5 ans. Donc vous voyez un peu l'impact positif qu'a eu HK+, sur euh, les actions que nous avons menées. Et cela a consisté pratiquement à 60% des activités qui ont été planifiées et réalisées grâce donc à HK+. Alors, nous avons également euh, quelque chose en commun, hein, tous les, les trois ministres qui sont là, c'est justement l'implication très forte de la communauté. 
Alors nous, en Côte d'Ivoire, on a une spécificité, c'est que les leaders d'opinion communautaire s'impliquent dans pratiquement toutes les activités. Ce sont de vrais relais. Et donc les, les leaders religieux, les leaders d'opinion, les leaders traditionnels, puisque euh, le président de la République, euh, disons que le, le ministère de la Sécurité à vient, vient de faire voter une loi impliquant, donnant un statut aux chefs religieux. Donc ils ont un rôle extrêmement important euh, à jouer, surtout dans le cadre de cette mentalité maternelle et infantile. Je, voudrais vous, je parlais des données tout à l'heure, hein, et donc le système de collecte de données a été renforcé pour la notification des, des, des décès maternels, et même à l'au-delà, dans le cadre même des décès euh, des, euh, des enfants. Alors, avoir des données, je veux dire, nous permet euh, de pouvoir euh, améliorer euh, ce, que nous, ce que nous faisons euh, sur le terrain. Nous avons, nous avons également bénéficié de l'expérience du Niger avec l'école des, des, des maris, euh, qui est une chose qui est extrêmement, qui fonctionne très très bien. Et vous savez, dans la mentalité euh, africaine, euh, quand on est dans les villages, on ne peut pas comprendre qu'on puisse donner la, la contraception à son épouse, malgré le fait que de plus en plus, on pousse les femmes à respecter donc, les, les quatre consultations prénatales indispensables afin de pouvoir mener une grossesse à terme. L'implication des maris nous a permis de ré faire régresser considérablement donc, euh, cette euh, volonté euh, de, de vouloir à tout prix, euh, dès qu'un enfant marche, euh, aussitôt, il faut voir la femme enceinte parce que l'enfant marche déjà, donc on considère que la femme est à même de pouvoir supporter euh, une autre grossesse. Alors donc, les, les résultats sont très encourageants, hein, euh, comme je vous dis, on, on commence à beaucoup aimer les chiffres chez nous. Donc, vous dire que euh, en, de 2012 à 2013, particulièrement année de la santé, le taux de prévalence contraceptive est passé de 3 à 5 Nous avons également, euh, je vous ai parlé de la couverture de la, de la prévention en natale, qui est passée de 63 à 60 Et puis, bien sûr, dans le cas du, 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 du SIDA, nous avons la prophylaxie en ARV, hein, euh, pour prévenir la transmission mère-enfant, qui pour moi, en tout cas, qui est une adepte de la lutte contre le VH-SIDA, qui est passée de 50 à 75 C'est extrêmement important pour nous, cette mise à disposition des médicaments dans le cas de la femme qui est enceinte. Donc, euh, tout ça pour vous dire, monsieur le directeur exécutif, que la contribution de, de HK+, est extrêmement, a été extrêmement importante, surtout dans euh, le fait que, comme vous le savez chez nous, lorsqu'une femme accouche par voie, balle, voie basse, normalement, dès qu'elle a fini d'accoucher, on la libère. Le fait aujourd'hui de la maintenir au moins deux jours ou euh, trois jours, cela permet de suivre et... Cela permet de suivre et euh, de euh, pouvoir euh, réduire considérablement cette mortalité. Je pense que j'ai pu partager avec vous les éléments les plus importants concernant donc, cette contribution euh, avec HK+, et euh, seulement vous dire que la prise en charge intégrée des maladies du nouveau-né et de l'enfant est une également une, a été également une possibilité pour nous de pouvoir donc appliquer cette initiative, vous remercier et remercier tous les partenaires ici présents et dire également cette phrase que j'adore euh, en Côte d'Ivoire, aucune femme ne meurt, ne va mourir en donnant la vie et où chaque enfant naît en bonne santé et vit sainement. Je vous remercie. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And I'm just, uh, I like the issue of numbers because you are giving us numbers uh, to for this. Now we now of course you know family planning, the husband school. The husband school is something which is now going through West Africa. It started in J UNFP started it, and we have MTCT. We have all the things that the H4 Plus has been able to contribute to in in uh, agriculture uh, to enable us to attain the things we're talking about. Of course, we we'll lack accelerate action uh, to further this now. We want to end at 9.30. We have five minutes to go. And I know that uh, there are burning questions. I also know that Tim Evans is in the house. Now, I'm torn. Uh, Tim Evans represents the World Bank. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give him one minute to make a statement, then I'll take two questions, and then we'll end. Tim. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ed. Thank you. Hi, hi, hi.
Thank you very much. And I, I think I've, I've taken 30 seconds getting up to the table. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just say uh, that uh, I think uh, coming in late to this event as I did due to the Ebola emergency, um, I'm impressed by the sense of excitement uh, that uh, is palpable here and elsewhere when people look at the opportunity of, uh, before us with respect to the Every Woman, Every Child um, uh, movement. And I think that the HR, H4 Plus has been a, a key driver in that, and we're very proud to be part of it. Uh, my 15 seconds of contribution here relates to uh, Minister Cassette's implementation at scale. Uh, we really have to work towards financing at scale. And I think uh, we're working with the H4 Plus to look at how we can make sure we have scaled up smart and smarter and sustained financing starting now in 2014 but right through to 2030 as part of our SDG agenda. So the bank um, together with partners is delighted to be uh, working on that agenda as a critical complement to everything else that is so central to this agenda. Thank you very much. This way. <laughs> now, I just want to uh, again emphasize the H4 Plus is the virtual UNICEF, UNFP, UNAIDS, the World Bank, and UN Women. You would ask me why, why we're still retaining four? Because the four started first, you know, the health agencies, and then the plus allows everybody to come in uh, to advise. Uh, so uh, let me thank you for the statement you've made. I think that the financing, of course, is a major part of the work we do, uh, making sure that we can deliver and making sure we can assist governments with ready uh, programs and uh, ready plans to be able to get the resources which they need uh, to drive. Now, of course, uh, we, we, we heard from uh, the government about what they are doing and the kinds of things they want to take to scale. So I think together as each four plus, we should work with them so that we can identify financing opportunities to be able to take this to scale. I think that's probably the most important message I can, I can give at this point in time. Now, I'm going to allow one question and then I'm going to end. Yes, Carol. You have to use my. Really yeah. Sorry, Carol Bashan, partnership for maternal newborn and child health. Not so much a question as a comment. We've heard very welcome stuff about more efficient international system, more resources, more efficiency. So just an offer, because we've got so much energy in this room. We're talking about maybe a further evolution of every woman, every child up to 2030. We in the partnership would love to be the platform that you refer to, the multi-stakeholder platform, 650 members across all different constituencies to have that consultation. So we really can do what the Minister from Côte d'Ivoire said at the end, get to that point where no woman or no child dies unnecessarily. Thank you. Now, let me uh, thank you all for, I think this has been a wonderful audience, and, uh, and I hope you have, we have been able to, in the one and a half hours of conversation, uh, let you uh, into uh, some of the things that h Plus has been able to do, and the plans it has going forward, working with countries, and the countries that have come here to actually give testimonies, and I think it's important one, two things that I, we, want, we must underscore is that two of the countries are in transition. They are, they are building resilience, DRC, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and uh, this is what we see around the world, and our network clause is on the ground, making sure that we can work together as one, making sure 
we can help countries build those plans, costed and available for financing, making sure that they are not pilots and they can be taken to scale, making sure that uh, beyond the implementation there are reports to show, making sure that data is solid and robust, and making sure that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, no woman dies given life. Thank you very much.